so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the EPOSA session eight on general urology BPH low unit LUTs. Uh, my name is Matthew Leon, I'm a consultant urologist at Writing for Wigan and Lee, um, and um, one of the session co chairs together with Toby Page. Um, just by way of introduction, there uh, was a lot of high quality accepted posters and um, I'll present uh, six, the first six posters and round up presentations and review. So the first poster uh, is a long term prospective multinational observational registry study called Evolution. Um, it's a European uh, study uh, to assess the effect of medical treatment of BP LUTs on the quality of life. And this is data collected from both primary and secondary care. Uh, the lead author was Nikita Bat. Um, the tools they use were IPSS, uh, BPH Impact Index, and Euro Quality of Life Five Dimension. Um, I've just put a slide here for the Euro Quality of Life Five Dimension. So the descriptive systems on these forms uh, look into mobility, self care, um, effect on activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, depression. So across the board with quality of life. And on the right side of the screen, um, there's a scale for naught to 100 based on uh, best health uh, at 100 and naught to worst health you can imagine. So it's a quite extensive study, uh, over 1800 BP patients and full records were available uh, for uh, 12,500 patients. So 1,250 patients. 70% of these patients were previously treated, and about 17% of discontinued treatment, mainly due to lack of efficacy. So the study uh, found that uh, BPH medical treatment resulted statistically significant improvement in quality of life in only in the treatment naive group. Um, after five years of follow-up from symptom onset, quality of life impairment were shown to be comparable to other chronic diseases, although uh, no specific data on this was provided in the abstract. So my take home message from this poster is that there's no quality of life benefit in re-challenging patients with medical treatment for BPH. Um, I agree with their conclusions that earlier surgical intervention should be considered in those not responding to medical therapy. So the second poster uh, was looking at combination therapy for urinary retention in a pre-treated population. Um, the lead author was Aman Keeler uh, from Wolverhampton. So um, they assessed the utility of combined alpha blocker and 5-alpha reductase inhibitor treatment for acute urinary retention patients, a relatively under-investigated approach. Uh, they stratified uh, patients with respect to alpha blocker pretreated um, and treatment naive. So um, their methodology was that patients presenting with acute urinary retention were catheterized, started on alpha blockers and referred for a trial with that catheter. If they were unsuccessful with the trial with that catheter, they were offered long-term catheter surgery or combination treatment with delayed trial with that catheter. Um, their protocol was uh, for a TWOC attempted at three months following combination treatment, and they failed a further TWOC at six months. Uh, nearly 100 patients were included in this study. The mean age was 78 years old, um, and you can see the results of 57% uh, of patients had a successful trial that catheter following combination three treatment. Uh, with its average length of time on combination treatment of 2.4 months. 40% uh, of these patients who had successful TWOT were deemed unfit for surgery and or were over 80 years old. Um, most patients in this cohort were previously on alpha blockers prior to combination of combination treatment. So here are the conclusions. Um, they stratified um, post catheterization residual um, and they found similar success rates, uh, whether less than one litre or more than one litre. Uh, they found that commencing TWOC before 2.9 months had a higher chance of failure, and therefore their recommendation was for 
uh, a talk at three months. Um, so the take home message is fairly straightforward. We should, con we should consider offering combination treatment with delayed trial that capita at three months in patients presenting with acute urinary retention and failed initial TWOP, um, probably quite pertinent in this COVID era. And um, they mentioned 60% success rate. And this figure is similar to a study later on uh, that will uh, present um, showing 60% success rates with uh, TRP. So the third poster um, is uh, looking at the widespread use of anticoagulation antiplatelets um, and additional uh, hospital visits post procedure. Uh, obviously, it's not an insignificant issue and potential, uh, potentially avoidable. Um, so this, the lead author was Emily Phillips from East Kent Hospitals. Um, they looked at patients over 60 years old undergoing elective urological procedures with emergency department attendants and the diagnosis of hematuria within 30 days of the original procedure. There were nearly 400 patients studied retrospectively over one year. Um, so 131 episodes fulfilled the criteria. 73 of these patients were anticoagulated. Uh, the most common procedure uh, was a uh, bladder biopsy resulting in emergency department admission, attendance or readmission. And the most commonly used agents uh, were rivaroxaban and aspirin. Um, I've taken uh, the results from their uh, poster. And as you can see on the left slide, um, the range of agents that, that were used. Um, importantly, I think um, if you look at none, uh, there's quite a lot of emissions, emergency readmissions, AD intensities um, on, that, uh, on that bar. On the right uh, graph, um, they presented the number of cases by anticoagulation restarted um, post procedure. And you can see there's a big dip between day one and day two, and a further dip at day four. They presented the odds ratio um, for uh, emergency department uh, attendance was uh, 2.1 and for readmission 3.41 compared to patients not on anticoagulation. So their conclusions were that adequate counselling of patients preoperatively and careful timing of restarting anticoagulation um, has to be considered to reduce attendances. Uh, and they, based on their results, recommended a study to look at stopping anticoagulation in the higher risk groups post-op, uh, plus or minus bridging therapy as necessary. So my take home messages from this poster was, uh, would be that in the high risk groups, consider stopping anticoagulation for greater than one day post-procedure. Um, obviously, review local policies and stopping agents pre-procedure, uh, but there's nothing saying that I wouldn't stop uh, low dose aspirin, as is my standard practice. So poster four, why one should stop bang in the urology clinic. Uh, this is a poster from Sergei Tatayev at Ashford and St. Peter's. Um, stop bang is a questionnaire which is widely used for risk stratification of patients at risk of obstructive sleep apnea where obstructive sleep apnea is a recognized cause of nocturia. Um, here's the questionnaire. So it's a very straightforward questionnaire whether uh, you have snoring, um, daytime uh, tiredness, uh, high blood pressure, high BMI, age over 50. Um, and if you score uh, more than three, uh, you'll be, you're on the intermediate risk and more than five on the high risk. Sorry, um, and um, patients with bothersome nocturia were offered routine assessment with a stop bang and a sleep study for those scoring greater than three or three with evidence of cardiovascular disease. Uh, there were 71 patients, a median nocturia frequency of patients presenting was four. So in this study, 35 patients that 
risk of underdiagnosed OSA were referred for sleep studies. The median score was five. So that correlates with a high risk score. Um, nearly 90% of uh, sleep studies demonstrated OSA. So quite a good correlation as a screening study. Um, and nine patients in this study had moderate or severe OSA denied snoring. So uh, the outcomes of this study were that uh, 18 patients underwent bad outlet procedures, 19 were prescribed desmopressin, and overall in this cohort, median nocturial frequency in patients decreased significantly from four to one. So I suppose my take home message is, is that when we assess patients in the prostate assessment clinic, um, especially when there's evidence of nocturial, we should offer the um, OSA screening tool, this stop band screening tool, which can be an additional form uh, for them to complete in the waiting area before you, uh, you see them. Um, and this study nicely shows that um, if you treat the uh, obstructive sleep apnea, you're more likely to respond to standard treatment. And certainly if you don't have it, uh, you have a good outcome. Um, sorry, can we just repeat that, Louise? Yeah, no problem. Uh, so but I don't know where to, should I just start the poster completely? <laughs> yeah, if you want um, to, that's fine. No problem. Yeah, so just start poster four, sorry. That's fine. Go for it. Great. Uh, so poster four, why one should stop bang in the urology clinic. Uh, this is a poster uh, from um, lead author of Sergei Tataya from Ashford and St. Peter's. Uh, stop bang and questionnaires widely used for risk stratification of patients at risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And it's well known as a recognized cause of nocturia. So this is the questionnaire. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward um, questionnaire, um, looking at whether the patient's snoring, um, observed to stop breathing during uh, sleep, high blood pressure, um, age over 50 and the score stratification uh, would be low risk, intermediate risk when they score three to four points and high risk, five to eight points. Um, in this study, patients with bothersome nocturia were offered routine assessment with this questionnaire and a sleep study for those scoring greater than three or three with evidence of cardiovascular disease. So that would be the intermediate and the high risk group. A retrospective review was carried out in 71 patients. The median nocturia frequency um, on presentation was four. So 35 patients were at risk of undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea were referred for sleep studies. The median score was five, which um, would be in the severe or the high risk category. Um, nearly 90% of sleep studies demonstrate the presence of obstructive sleep apnea, so quite a good correlation for a screening test. Um, interestingly, nine patients, um, that's 39% of patients with moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea denied snoring. So in terms of outcomes, 18%, uh, 18 patients underwent uh, bladder outlet procedures, 19 were prescribed desmopressin, and there's a significant improvement in the median nocturia frequency uh, from four to one after um, this study and treatment. So the take home messages from this uh, study was uh, for me with, to use this uh, stop bang OSA screening tool in patients presenting with nocturia is something which can be given in addition to the IPSS form when patients send, attend prostate assessment clinic. Um, the, Study authors um, state that patients without obstructive sleep apnea are more likely to respond to standard therapies, and certainly they have uh, very good outcomes in this study. Uh, poster five: uh, Do residual volumes uh, with chronic urinary retention predict outcomes of TRP? This is uh, the lead author was Yuta Thackeray. Uh, the Royal Free Hospital. Um, this is a database search 
over a six year period and success was defined as freedom from urinary catheter. Um, over this period, 93 TRPs were carried out for chronic retention. 50% uh, were successful. Uh, there was a statistically significant um, likelihood of successful, uh, success um, if patients were less than 70 years old compared to if they were greater than 75 years old. No difference was seen in um, comorbidities and no difference in mean residual volume for success. Uh, where that's approximately 1.4 and failures of 1.2. Um, in this study, 58 patients had urodynamic confirmed bladder outflow obstruction, uh, of which 59% were uh, successful. Uh, so the conclusions from the study that there you see better outcomes in bladder outflow obstruction surgery for chronic urine intention in patients under 70 years compared to greater than 75 years, not related to residual volumes or presence of significant comorbidities. I'd like to add an additional take home message that in these patients, perhaps we need to consider alternative bladder outflow obstruction surgery, um, a later poster in this session uh, from uh, the Cambridge group shows greater than 98% success with HOLEP, uh, where in this study, um, less than 60% was uh, Sure. Uh, so poster six was a closed loop audit, uh, reducing catheter related morbidity and improving TRP waiting times in line with getting it right first time recommendations. Uh, lead author Angela Lamb from Epson and St. Helia, uh, a really good um, a closed audit loop. Um, looking at two RP outcomes in 2018 in their department, um, where um, after an initial audit, the department set aims for a 30 day waiting time for surgery if the patient um, was uh, remained with a catheter. They audited, they reordered their results over a two month period. So over this period, the first uh, audit, 180 modern patients had a TRP, of which 65 were catheterized. The mean waiting this time for TRP was uh, 119 days. But they identified that eight patients were readmitted due to urosepsis uh, whilst on the waiting list, all had catheter preoperatively. Um, that was uh, a 1.4 A&E episode per catheterized patient. So these results uh, were presented locally and simple measures were advised such as tick box on uh, list, listing slips if catheters in situ and a recommendation for a listing within 30 days. So when they reordered their results, um, six out of the 18 patients were catheterized, um, 11 attended A&E but uh, no admissions. And the mean waiting time was significantly reduced to 29 days for the catheterized patients. So my conclusions uh, were obviously uh, significant improvement of waiting times for TRP. In fact, in the poster, uh, they showed that even if the patients weren't waiting uh, for catheters, the uh, TRP waiting time uh, was uh, 33 days whilst on the list. I don't know whether it's because of the increase of awareness within the department, more theatre time or staff or, or possibly logbook requirements of the trainees. Um, I felt that a re-audit would be really helpful. Um, and um, if these results are maintained, um, sharing their experience with getting it right first time, best practice. Good, so this poster, interesting poster, uh, from the group, mainly at Imperial, a very large retrospective analysis, actually one of the biggest retrospective analysis of resume treatment based in two centres. What's particularly interesting in this is 20% of the cohort had prostates more than 80 cubic centimetres, which compared to the McVary uh, randomised control trial is a bigger group of prostates and probably reflects real life uh, treatment of sort of patients that we're keener to refer. In this cohort, 81% were under general anaesthetic, clearly with COVID, 
uh, that might change. And one of the things we're all interested in is how we can use resume uh, under local anaesthetic, possibly even in an outpatient setting uh, to help with our COVID delivery problems and also decrease, decrease the risk of COVID and general anaesthesia. Much like the previously published data, this trial demonstrated a good IPSS change at three months and a very low Clavian Dindo complication rate of 1.8%. Compared to the major RCTs, the change in IPSS was uh, very, very similar. Retreatment rate in previously published cohorts of 4.4% at four years. In this trial, we only have a limited period of follow-up, but they've demonstrated a 1.8% uh, retreatment rate. We need to bear in mind if we convert that to Eurolift, which has a 13.6% retreatment rate at five years, TURP much debated what retreatment rate is, somewhere between three to 15% at uh, around five to 10 years, or HOLEP data somewhere between one to 5% at 10 years. So a very acceptable retreatment rate. Moving on, this real world outcome data set expands from the previously published data from the real world series of prostatic urethral lift by adding in the UK dent data and giving us the largest published series of prostatic urethral lift so far. Three uh, centres across UK, Australia, and America, 22 sites, clearly a very large study comparing both patients in retention and patients with LUTs. Similar IPSSs to previous studies and very equivalent data on safety and outcomes. What's particularly interesting in this study is the inclusion of patients with background prostat prostatic carcinoma. These patients were previously excluded from a number of the early trials for obvious reasons. But as this is real world data, a number of patients were treated with prostate cancer, even knowingly, or then diagnosed at a later date. And these patients have still shown good outcomes. This is particularly an interesting area for patients who are waiting radiotherapy, who need bladder outlet surgery prior to radiotherapy, where prostatic urethral lift is a really quick, easy treatment that they can have, particularly in the COVID era, before having their radiotherapy. Looking at this data, it'd be useful to have a little bit more information about uh, modes of treatment, general anaesthetic versus sedation versus local anaesthetic. And clearly there's a drive to trying to treat patients under local anaesthetic, both from a cost saving and to increase capacity. Interestingly, the Pulsar group uh, versus the real world retention group over here in this results box had a slightly better outcome in the Pulsar study. Pulsar patients were a highly selected group who had uh, were selected for a number of reasons, whereas real world data are all comers. One thing we should mention is the authors of this paper and the 22 sites are all high output urethral lift surgeons. So it looks like looking at the numbers that the authors here all well known high volume surgeons and it may be that some of the data presented here might not reflect surgeons experience who are doing smaller numbers of prostatic urethral lift. Moving on this group at Addenbrooke's have presented their data looking at the time that men wait with a catheter before having HOLAP laser surgery. The question being asked does the time with a catheter affect surgical outcomes? Clearly, the GERF data has looked at many units and questioned how long men are waiting with a catheter for surgery. That obviously over this year will have got worse due to capacity problems and difficulty in getting men treated. The group split men into three groups, less than two weeks, and then two to four, and then greater than one month, with a significant number of men being in the third group, 167, and only a very small number of men being in the early treatment group. Looking at this data, there are a few things to highlight, particularly the high rate of success with HOLEP in all groups at, at all groups. Looking at this data, there's particular success in all groups in trial without catheter, with almost all men becoming catheter free, with just a very small percentage 
actually remaining with a catheter after treatment, independent of how long they had had a catheter in. Many men are concerned that by waiting a long time for their surgery, they're more likely to have a worse outcome. And this study doesn't show that. Understandably, however, it does highlight the fact that those men having catheters in for a longer period are more likely to have problems with sepsis. It'd be interesting to uh, also know a little bit more detail about the early treatment group. Did any of those have high pressure chronic retention? Of course, the textbook teaching is that we should delay bladder outlet surgery for men presenting with high pressure chronic retention but a little bit more detail in that early treatment group about whether any of those men had evidence of high pressure chronic retention had early treatment without any harm would be in interesting data. The other interesting group to look at would be what I refer to as the super long waiters. These are men who may be waiting six months or more for their surgery. Do they have a worse outcome, particularly with results involving their continence and storage symptoms afterwards? This group have done a systemic review and network meta-analysis of the effects of erectile function on a number of different ways of, of different types of bladder outlet surgery. 48 studies were included. The search was done in October 29. Interestingly, it adds to the previous network meta-analysis by Zua et al. in 2016. That uh, network meta-analysis showed actually that HOLEP and PK enucleation of the prostate had a pro-erectile effect and PVP green light vaporization probably had the worst outcome. Clearly the network meta-analysis in 2016 didn't include data on some of the newer treatments that this abstract poster adds, particularly with prostatic urethral lift and aqua ablation. One of the nice things about this paper is the different time points at which they've assessed things, and it does reinforce the need for us to have long term outcomes for some of the newer treatments for bladder outlet obstruction. No data in this study includes resume, and we do need to think about rerunning these type of network meta analysis to look at the effects of prostatic urethral lift. I tend and resume in the future as these newer minimally invasive treatments are targeted, particularly at men who are more concerned about erectile function. One of the things that this study does highlight is a concern that maybe um, aqua ablation and PAE may affect uh, erectile function. We don't know that the how many men had uh, assessments of their erectile function pre and post treatment and clearly if they only have an assessment post treatment there may be a number of men who've actually had poor erectile function before being treated. It's difficult to understand a mode by which aquablation would actually cause erectile dysfunction as it does not involve any heat or direct energy that may affect the nerves going to the penis. Likewise, prostate artery embolization, you could postulate that there would be some inadvertent uh, non-target embolization to damage penile uh, function. But when this does happen, uh, it's usually fairly apparent with small areas of necrosis on the glands of the penis. So a little bit further information about the mode of action that these effects are being seen would be very interesting. This study looked at how um, we can really push forward to bring bipolar TURP back in to compete against some of the minimally invasive treatments that are currently being marketed, particularly as a day case procedure. Retrospective study looking at when men were discharged. I would add that patients were discharged on day one, not day zero, and then on day two. Some interesting data, including surgical grade, and nice to see that in the group that had an earlier trial about catheter within 24 hours, the majority were actually operated on by a registrar, not a consultant. This may represent selection bias that they had smaller, more straightforward um, prostates. What isn't clear in this paper is the decision to undertake a TWOC, what uh, criteria were used for that. Certainly it wasn't a randomized control trial suggesting uh, this group has a truck at 24 hours and another group doesn't. 
The outcomes, however, from this paper do add weight to the fact that in selected patients, an early trial of our catheter is acceptable with no increase in readmissions and no concerns about ongoing hematuria. This, sort, this data reflects what we already know from a number of other modalities, such as prostate vaporization by either laser or bipolar electrode, and other laser modalities such as HOLEP or THULEP, all of which allow early removal of catheters. This almost certainly reflects in this series a degree of vigilance about excellent hemostasis. And it'd be nice to look at the catheter time for the group who have an early TWOC less than 24 hours to see how many of those patients actually had a TWOC at an earlier time frame, such as six or 12 hours, and also to consider whether those patients could have been discharged as a true day case some six to eight hours after surgery with a, with a catheter in situ to come back at a later date to have the catheter removed to really uh, allow true same day discharge and same day treatment. This paper on combining bladder outflow surgery with cystolitholopaxy again looks at his old chestnut, should we be combining both procedures? Nice paper retrospective analysis of a good number of cases. And interestingly, a number of different modes of stone extraction used. Of the group, only 25% had simultaneous procedures, but it's interesting to note the really significant difference in operating time with those men having just sister lithopaxy, having uh, a short operation with a median of 22 minutes compared, compared to those having a combined procedure of 48 minutes. With the pressure we all have now on trying to clear the backlog of work and get men treated, this certainly supports an argument that in those men who do not need bladder outlet surgery, who have minimal urinary symptoms, actually just going ahead with a cystolithopaxy is probably a good option. Of those men that did just have a cystolithopaxy, only 25% of that cohort went on to have bladder outlet surgery. And overall, only 43% of the entire cohort required uh, bladder outlet surgery, which would suggest that a large number of men, nearly 50%, are going to be happy with just having a cystolithopaxy. A longer term follow-up of this cohort to see how many of those men then go on to have delayed bladder outlet surgery treatment in the future would be very interesting. Likewise, it would be interesting to look at how the role of minimally invasive treatments combine with cystolithopaxy. So is there a role for cystolithopaxy combined with either resume or prostatic urethral lift in, as these are much quicker procedures to treat bladder outlet obstruction. 